Hi, this is your professor, Pat Hanahudash, and I want to talk to you about this poem, When the Burning Begins, by Patricia Smith. Now, this poem is a really good example of what I've been talking about in terms of using concrete details and figurative language to render something that is more abstract and to make it interesting, to be able to help us to empathize with what the speaker is saying or the poet is saying rather than just being told um, how you feel. She never tells us how she feels in this poem. We figure it out and end up empathizing with her uh, through the poem because of her details. The poem also turns at the end, which is a, an important thing to do in a contemporary poem. Actually, all poems kind of turn at the end in that last one or two stanzas. So it well, I'll show you when we get there, but it's an important way for the poem to bring everything together and make a deeper point. So let me read it to you first, and then um, as we go through, I'll go back and, and talk more about it. When the burning begins for Otis Douglas Smith, my father. The recipe for hot water cornbread is simple. Cornmeal, hot water, mixed till sluggish, then dollop in a sizzling skillet. When you smell the burning begin, flip it. When you smell the burning begin again, dump it onto a plate. You've got to wait for the burning and get it just right. Before the bread cools down, smear it with sweet salted butter and smash it with your fingers. Crumple it up in a bowl of collard greens or buttermilk. Forget that I'm telling you it's the first thing I ever cooked, that my daddy was laughing and breathing and no bullet in his head when he taught me. Mix it till it looks like quicksand, he'd say, till it moves like a slow song sounds. We'd sit there in the kitchen, licking our fingers and laughing at my mother, who was probably scrubbing something with bleach or watching Bonanza, or thinking how stupid it was to be burning that nasty old bread in that cast iron skillet. When I told her that I'd made my first ever pan of hot water cornbread, and that my daddy had branded it glorious, she sniffed and kept mopping the floor over and over in the same place. So here's how you do it. You take out a bowl like the one we had with blue flowers and only one crack. You put the cornmeal in it. Then you turn on the hot water and you let it run while you tell the story about the boy who kissed your cheek after school or about how you really want to be a reporter instead of a teacher or nurse like Mama said. And the water keeps running while Daddy says, you will be a wonderful writer and you will be famous someday. And when you get famous, if I wrote you a letter and send you some money, would you write about me? And he's laughing and breathing and no bullet in his head. So you let the water run into this mix till it moves like mud moves at the bottom of a river, which is another thing Daddy said. And even though I'd never even seen a river, I knew exactly what he meant. Then you turn the fire way up under the skillet and you pour in this mix that moves like mud moves at the bottom of a river, like quicksand, like slow song sounds. That stuff pops something awful when it first hits that blazing skillet and sometimes daddy and I would dance to those angry pop sounds. He'd let me reset my feet on top of his while we waltzed around the kitchen and my mother huffed and puffed on the other side of the door. When you are famous, Daddy asks me, will you write about dancing in the kitchen with your father? I say, everything I write will be about you, then you will be famous too. And we dip and swirl and spin, but then he stops and sniffs the air. The thing you have to remember about hot water cornbread is to wait for the burning so you know when to flip it, and then again so you know when it's crusty and done. Then eat it the way we did, with our fingers, our feet still tingling from dancing. But remember, 
that sometimes the burning takes such a long time. And in that time, sometimes poems are born. Okay, let's go back up. So this part here is actually what we call an epigraph. Um, you know, if you're going to dedicate something to someone, that's what you do. Notice she starts right away, talks about it as if it's a recipe. But this becomes much more than a recipe. So the point of view here is the speaker speaking directly to the audience. Sorry about that phone going off. Um, the cornbread becomes symbolic throughout the poem. And it sort of changes as the poem goes. So ask yourself, can you tell by the end of the poem what it's symbolic of? The burning becomes a metaphor here for more than just the smell. It becomes even almost symbolic, a symbol even by the end. Again, think about what it becomes symbolic of, a metaphor for. And she repeats these things. These things appear over and over again throughout the poem. They're woven through it, kind of like a braid. Um, again, this sounds like a recipe, but really it's much more about that. And this is where we begin to find out that it's more than just a recipe. Um, here, this is an important part of the poem. Here is where she is saying, my daddy was laughing and breathing and no bullet in his head when he taught me. And so we understand that much later, he does get a bullet in the head and dies. She doesn't come out and say that. This is a type of apophysis um, where you're saying, you're trying to show what something is by showing what it's not. So here she's saying, you know, he's alive because he's not dead yet. Um, and so we know that in real life, at this point when she wrote this, he was in fact dead. And so we begin to feel the grief that is woven into this poem as well. We get his, what he's saying here. So we hear his voice, which is important. And note that here she uses italics rather than quotation marks because it, it emphasizes more what it was, what it is he saying, it emphasizes his voice. It's also a little less awkward to use italics rather than quotation marks. And this is a common thing you'll see in a lot of contemporary poetry. People will do this, they'll use italics instead of quotation marks. Um, note the details of the mother. They're in a sharp contrast to the details of the father. And so by seeing this contrast between what the mother does and says and what the father does and says, we get an understanding of, first of all, her relationship with both of them, but also the relationship perhaps between them. Um, and then again, this kind of takes on a form that is sort of like a recipe. She's directly addressing you, but it obviously is not. Um, and then we have the stories, the way that she talks to her father, when she tells her father. So we begin to understand her age in here. Um, and again, we, we learn something about all the personalities and their relationships in here. Um, particularly about him, the father. And we can almost hear her grief underneath this. Especially when she says here. And he's laughing and breathing and no bullet in his head. And then again, we have a number, quite a number of metaphors in here, similes. Um, all of these things are acting, not, I mean, they're acting literally, but they're also acting much more deeply, even in the de the concrete details. You see again how they're dancing. Here's a moment of irony because she is in fact writing about him in this poem now that she's famous and making him, bringing him to life this way. 
And here again, we get, we, she comes back to the cornbread, the burning, okay, and the dancing and the burning. And they are much, much more deeply symbolic here at this point. And then, and here, by the way, in the beginning of this, this stanza is where the poem turns. The poem becomes about something much more deep, even than just about the relationship. And the ending is surprising. So the, become, the poem becomes not just about her grief, it's about writing poems, and about what poems are, which are recipes for how to survive something like grief, and so on. You can do all kinds of things with this in terms of what the poem means and what you think the poet is trying to say. Um, Note to the sound devices that she's using in here. I didn't point them out in my notes here, but um, there are a lot of them, some of them more obvious than others. Um, slow song sounds, this is alliteration. But there were also moments where you get um, sound here. Um, plate and weight, this is an inner rhyme here, um, and so on. The repetitions, the word smell, and so on. So there are a lot of different things she's doing with sound, too, throughout this, um, that we don't necessarily notice until we go back and really look for them, but we hear it, it's what the things that make the poem sound so nice, sound so strong. Um, and it's not an accident that a lot of the alliteration in here, and we can find it in a number of places, are S's. You know, how stupid it is to be burning the cast skillet, and sniffed, and so on. Um, so that's the same sound, like the sound of something burning, or the sound of someone disapproving. Okay, so you, you get a lot of that throughout this poem. Um, and that's deliberate. Um, There's something in my notes here. Why do you think she's doing these things? Um, you know, what does the cracked bowl tell us? It tells us they're not rich. Um, it tells us that the bowl is something special, something prized, um, something cherished. But the fact that it's cracked also could also be symbolic of family relationships. Um, there are a lot of things you can do with the symbolism of that, but it's such a very specific, particular details. And those are the things that make the poem, those specific, concrete details. They're important. The dancing is also symbolic. Symbolic of their relationship, love, life, all kinds of things. Um, and every time she uses the term the burning, it takes on more meaning. Now, if you go back through the poem and read it again, and consider all the specific concrete details, think about how do they work, how do they add depth, and so on. I'm going to put my annotated version of this. Um, in here as well, so you can go back and read it. You will have to just go back and look through this video. Um, but to do that and just think about what you can learn from writing about poems from this poem. Right. Um, if you have any questions, let me know.